That's how we own it. What's good, That's family? We I'm your girl, Tamika D. Mallory. And it's your boy, my son, the general. And we are your host of Street Politicians, the, the place, place where the streets, streets and, and politics, politics meet. meet. What's going on, my son, Lennon? What's going on, man? We just had a good week, relaxed a little bit. The weather ain't completely freezing. It could be better, but it ain't freezing. It's freezing. No, I don't know what you're talking about. It's not completely, absolutely freezing. No, 40 and 50 is good. I take 40 and 50 over 30 and 20. 40 is freezing. Because at night it's 30. And you know, I've been going out at night here and there. Okay. I just wanted to be, I just want the record Listen, to be okay, clear. You outside with it. You've been outside with it. I've been going out. I've been looking cute and doing something because sitting in the house is not going to accomplish any of the things that I need to get done. They don't, you can't make no money in the house. But you I guess people are, people you are making money. In the house. In the house now. Yeah, but the thing is, in order to get the position in the house, you got to go outside, find the people, get the, the relationship set up. Then you can bring the work inside the house and make it happen. But you're not getting ready to sit all day long on the internet and never um, uh, uh, network with other individuals and then just come up with a million dollar thing. It's not going to happen. Even if you have a new product, you might be making it in your basement. But at some point, you got to go sell it to somebody. Well, you got enough resources. At this point, you got enough resources, relationships. If you come with ideas, you can sit there because you've done it and get on that computer and say, Lana, let's figure this out. Because nah, 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 nah. I've been your way anyway. I've been telling you to get outside anyway. You've got to go outside. I don't need to be outside. My bed is perfect. I got my computer. I'm working. Now, all of a sudden, I you still have to, to go outside. outside. I still have to go outside. I still have to be at events. I still have to. Now we're opening back up. You know, students don't want to necessarily be on virtual. So I have to go to states and meet people. COVID is becoming a thing again, where all of a sudden folks are starting to get infected with COVID in, in large groups. Um, I just had actually my makeup artist was just telling me that a group of her friends were together recently. They've been getting together for a while, but just this time that they got together, uh, several people within the group got COVID. Hopefully all of them will be fine and it won't you know, be life-threatening, but that's also a thing. So you know, there's a lot of stuff happening as always, but I do think that unfortunately we have to, I don't think we should ever return to a time where people have to work every day outside of their homes. I do not think that that is um, productive. I think we yeah, have- I don't know if that's really true. I just, I think there has to be a balance of anything. That's what I'm saying. I said, that's why okay. I said every day. Well, you it know, depends on I the like, job that you have, right? You can't sweep, you can't sweep the floors from your house. You know what I'm saying? You can't, well, you can't manage well, the, the store well, that's down the block from your home. But what you can do, though, is set it up where people have a work schedule that allows coverage of individuals so that one person is not sweeping the floors for, you know, 40 hours a week, but instead they get a certain amount of hours, a pay increase. So they're still making the same amount of money. But that don't really, that don't really but add up to it. How it you get does. a pay increase? You want somebody to get a pay increase so can, for less work? No, no, let me, let me, let me okay, say. break it down. Because first of all, you. because okay. first of all, people should be allowed time to be able to take a class learn some other if we're if america is going to at any point ever in life in my lifetime in your lifetime mm -hmm. accomplish what it says and and rise to its greatest place then we would give people tools that they need so that they can make more money and be more successful right but if you are a person who's working all day, maybe two and three jobs, you might not have time to take a class also while you're trying to take care of your kids so you can get that promotion or what have you. The whole problem is that people who are sweeping floors are getting paid below the wage that it is required for them to be able to take care of their families. So if you're making $8 an hour, that should not be a thing anymore in our society. People, the, the minimum wage increase at $15 should be the norm and $15 ain't shit. So, so the thing about this, let's say mm -hmm. 
I got a little mom and pop store, mm -hmm. right? I'm paying $5,000 a month for the rent. I'm paying each employee $15, $15 an hour. I need about five or six employees. And I don't make the amount of money to pay none of these people. Right. right? So I, those those things are realistic. So if, 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 if you have a, if you're saying that people have to have a minimum amount of things, then there's less employees that I have. So if it's less employees that I have able to pay $15 and that's less people that's able to work throughout a 40 hour day. So if I only got, if I got to pay everybody $15 an hour, I only got two people I could pay, right? Cause I can't afford to pay nobody else. Well, here's because I'm not making enough money. The, the rent is too high, especially when you look at inflation. The rent in every the rent is too damn high. Everything is going all the way up. It's so true. to be able to do what you're talking about is very hard. I have to say two points on this. The first thing is that our government should be giving better subsidies to small businesses, right? So that these small businesses can access capital to keep them afloat where they have two pools of money, the money that they're bringing in from their products and services and the money that the government is supposed to give and does give to some, some businesses, right? Because if you are an MWBE in New York, and I don't know about other cities, I'm sure, I know that there are MWBE programs other places, but certainly in New York state, which is a minority woman owned business, right? And you apply for all of this stuff that take, of course, it's like, it's like, it's, it's almost like laying yourself on a slab and telling somebody to stab you a thousand times in order for you to actually get the, the, the certification. But if you are able to get it, one, you get in the pipeline for more contracts and that's everything from food services, cleaning services. So that's the little sweeping the floor jobs you're talking about all the way up to, you know, big contracts for the airport and the build things and what have you. You're supposed to be in line and sometimes front of the line to be able to put RFPs in to get those programs. But then there are also subsidies that come down from the state that should go to these small businesses so that you can stay afloat, so that you can, especially in times of like you got COVID and you have other things that happen that will help you to be able to pay your bills. The problem is that MWBEs, Black folks try to apply for it. You know how difficult it is for us with application processes, but what they say is women-owned businesses. So guess what happens? White women go get the licenses and the certification, and then they become the owner of the businesses that their white husbands are running. So again, every area, there is they some- They figured out a way. You remember what Trump said? Account. Trump said, don't be mad at me. I, I use the system. He used the system as it currently stands. But then the second thing is, it's corporate greed, right? Because a part of being able to level out things in our society is that corporations are taking so much. They have employees that are not being paid properly. Uh, they are not given the appropriate benefits and they're not paying their due share of taxes and other things to our society. And so therefore we're living in an unbalanced network, if you will, or reality. And that's one of our biggest challenges. So everything that I'm talking about, yeah, that's like vision for the future. That's hoping one day we'll find a president one day There'll be a president that will come forward that will have Donald Trump's balls. But oh, excuse me, I don't know if I'm supposed to say that. Hey, I said it. <laughs> Donald <laughs> Trump's um, testicular fortitude, but testicular fortitude, but 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 um, the moral standing of someone who actually wants to do right by society, where they will say, "I don't care if I don't get elected for another four years." But this is the shit that I'm going to put in place and I'm going to hold to my word regardless of whether people like me or not. I don't know when that's ever going to happen because everybody is out here so much for elections, but I would hope that. Yeah, that's that's going. I, I don't see that really happening. I don't see, but just understanding the justice system and the legal system and all of this system and government now, I just understand that it's, it's, it's all a game. It's all a game. So we just got to figure out how we can play the best we can and how do we exist within it 
and build structures, small structures that we can build infrastructures within this that eventually take over. That's yeah, the only I mean, thing I guess, we do. I guess when you really think about it, it's certain businesses, essential businesses that definitely, and to my point, if those people have to go to work for 40 hours a week, they damn sure should be being paid a essential wage, right? Um, but at the same time, I feel like people who work from home or, or are, excuse me, people who have jobs that are able to be conducted from home, they should be able to be on a schedule that provides opportunity for them to be with their kids, for them to, uh, you know, go to a class, take care of themselves and still be able to work. But then, yes, I think we, we all should absolutely be outside around other individuals talking, networking and connecting with people because there is there is. 100% a problem with uh, folks sitting at home and really starting to suffer from mental health issues, you know, as a result of them not being around other people. So I, I agree with you about that. Speaking of people being at home, can we talk about what's happening with public safety in schools? Mm -hmm. I mean, you've been getting calls every day from individuals. Every day. It's unbelievable. Like, you know, first of all, there's always somebody getting shot, man. RIP to the four kids that just got killed and 10 people got shot. Another vigilante is like, how does how does that continue that? You know, like I, I really just I, I, I'm not saying vigilante. I want to say school shooter, not vigilante because it wasn't vigilant. But how does it constantly are these kids able to walk into schools with guns and kill people? It's just to me, it just makes no sense. You know, but Ray Ray is walking in the school with a gun too. But the, I'm not saying he's not, but and I'm saying, how is he doing it? Right? How, how so is it? If you want more metal detectors, no, what I do want, you want? What I want is more, not metal detectors. I want more school probing. I want more school being attentive to the children. And, and may, I don't know if it's metal detectors per se. But I think that there has to be something set up to where kids aren't able to walk into school with guns. You know, well, like the only thing is, uh, Myers, that means law enforcement. So we have to, and I'm glad we're having this conversation because yeah. we really do need to talk through what is the next level, right? We, it, there is law enforcement is what. People can people immediately go towards. Now, we could say, well, we need to put more anti-violence experts in the school, right? Brothers like Shanduke McBatter and others who AT Mitchell and and I mean, I could get in trouble because the list is so long of those people who do that work. And we could say, let's put them in the school. But then if something happens and they are not accredited or have some type of specific certificate from the state or the city, they put themselves in danger that if something happens, it's blamed or placed at the feet of the anti-violence experts. But then you have law enforcement in the, in the school and clearly with metal detectors and everything else, that's not working. So I don't know. I think I think there has to be a system set up. I just think that at this point, I think there definitely needs to be different gun laws. Um, True. I think there should be some system set up. I don't know if it's metal detectors per se, but I think schools should have some type of structure which you just not allowed in school with guns. Like I just think there should be some level. And I but don't you're know. not allowed in school with guns now. Well, they're constantly getting in there with and killing people. So there has to be something. You know, I don't I'm I'm all against over policing, but I do think in, in these kids, our kids should be able to go to school and be safe. Like kids should not have to, you know, like you said, they the bullying and the way that kids are being the lack of real protection in school for kids. Is, is detrimental like you you we i've literally watched you know I, I even think about when i was in school there were kids able to come to school from different schools and just walk in and jump people and you know back in the days we had um um gangs called the decepticons 
who used to literally get on trains and come to schools and jump people, yeah. slash them, rob them, like do all th these things. With, and that was happening back in the 90s, you know, in, in the late 80s. So that was happening in our high school. They was able to get into school and rob people, you know, at gunpoint, at knife point. So I think there has to be a, a, a more robust strategy to protect kids, especially when you start getting to high school, like bullying in high school, and not as much as junior, but high school is a big thing. You know, there's a it's, it's a real big thing. And I, I have friends, we both have friends who reaching out saying that they're having issues. I remember my son was going to school in, in, in um, Washington Heights and he's like, kids were trying to jump him. Like I literally had to go to school. It was kids, it was all out brawls. I remember we used to have brawls and people brought guns to school. And it's like, there has to be a strategy to which, or you have people, like you said, violence interrupters who are in those streets and, you know, in those communities, in those schools, who probably kids who graduated from school and still have some notoriety in the schools and just don't want to go to college or whatever, and they have a job and they're like monitors. Kind of like, remember we had hall monitors back in the days, like we should have advanced mon hall monitors who, who go to the schools, who in the schoolyards, who at lunchrooms hearing, you know, such, such, because it's, it's always a gossip or oh, such, such as beefing. They're going to they gonna fight after school and we're going to jump them like, and they are able to get in front of those things because it's a serious thing. Like, it's not like little kids fighting in the school. At that point, it turns to with guns and knives and people are losing their lives in schools. Yeah, no, I mean, listen, you're not going to get a debate out of me. Something has to be done. I know, and, 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 and I think it starts with the top because the administration in many of these schools is not doing enough, either because they don't want to touch it or they don't want their schools ranked as being violent, um, you know, on their, in the stats. Also because privacy and protection becomes a thing, especially when you have ignorant parents, uh, like the parents of the young man who just killed those folks in whatever state that was in the, the white parents that told his, uh, you know, his, that told him don't get caught next time in the text messages. You either have ignorant parents like that, like Kyle Rittenhouse's mother, who was an evil criminal that took her son somewhere with guns that she knew he wasn't supposed to have, or you have ignorant parents like Tisha or, you know, Lisa in our community who is talking about leave my son alone, don't say shit to my son, you know, or my daughter or whatever, I'll come up there and do X, Y, Z, and that's right, it's on. So like you, on all sides, you've got parents that become a big part of the problem, a big part. And we don't like to talk about that. We love to sit by and watch a racist white person do something crazy and then we talk shit about them. We love to sit by and watch, you know, uh, uh, somebody who is, you know, a serial killer that we can identify all the things that happened and how the parents were no good and this and that and the third. But we don't like to also sit down and talk to regular folks that look like me and you in our communities and say this. Say cut the bullshit. Out. Cut it out. We need yeah. to be involved too. We do. We definitely do. So definitely. I don't, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know how you stop a person from bringing guns. I mean, we just saw that a kid in New York a couple of weeks ago had a gun. He got caught with a gun and $30,000. And then once they did more investigation, there were more guns in the school. Whether or not they were connected to him, I didn't follow the story enough to find out, but I know that there were guns in that school. So we know that this is a problem that's happening. And to your point, it's gotta be dealt with because people, history has shown when we don't address it as an institution, the school, the parents, people die, people commit suicide, people drop out of school, you wanna know why your kid isn't paying attention. Probably because they're depressed. They might be being bullied. They may just be tired of the bullshit, can't even focus in class. I know when I was in school, sometimes I could not focus in class for all the outbursts and the yelling and screaming that went on with all types of kids. So you can't say, well, let's go to the white schools because you got kids that showing up, they're pissed off about whatever their problems are out of their parents' basement shooting up the building. You can't say, okay, well, let's go to the school with the Latino kids because guess what? They slice your face. You can't say let's go to the school with the black kids because there's gang wars. 
everywhere our people turn, everywhere we turn, there's problems and discrimination and ways that you could try to escape the system and you can't. You cannot. Can't system. This system is is well is, is well designed for failure. And when you get out, I, that's why I celebrate anybody that gets out of the system, man, because it's set up like I tell people all the time when I look at the school system and the structure and being incarcerated, it's pretty much the same thing. It pretty much mirrors the average school pretty much mirrors the way that a prison is, is designed in the, the coloring, the way it looks, the, the, all of the, you can't the, be the mess the hall looks like the lunchroom. The gym looks like the same gym. Like only thing that's not in the, the, the classrooms is the only thing that the classrooms imitate the cells because the way it's lined up door to door, only thing that the, the schools don't have the cells. So, you know, when you think about it, man, I don't know, man. We, we, yeah, we but just, you we are saying school. you want more metal detectors or some kind of way. To but I, I do because th that's the way that they protect you in the jails, right? Because you got to walk through metal detectors. So a lot of times they catch you when you got a knife, the average person ain't gonna bring a knife to certain places or they figured out how to do it because they know that metal detector gonna go off, right? It's a lot more safer. And unfortunately, we we I don't know if it's metal detector is the answer, like I said, but I know there has to be something that makes it impossible, you know, or highly unlikely or, or hard as hell for you to get in school with a gun and kill somebody. Well, I'm sure there are some people in the at anti-violence space that would say no more, you know, it's not about police surveillance, it's not about metal detectives. I guess that's what they would say. I don't know. I'm with you. We don't know, but we're going to find out. I was just thinking about this, right? And, you know, I'm on social media on certain platforms um, for different reasons. Facebook specifically, I go there because my family members and friends are there. And when I post to Instagram, which is where I am most of the time, it shares over to Facebook. And I often forget the days to go on there and check out the comments. But my cousins, my parents, shout out to my father who just turned 75 years old two days ago. And man, happy birthday. And man, yeah, 75 years. Good man, too. It's a lot that a lot of brothers can learn from Stan Mallory. But anyway, but he would say it took him 75 years to learn it all. So, <laughs> Amen. Um, but I go there, you know, I try to keep up with Facebook. And so there is this, it happens on Instagram too, but it's very different. But on Facebook, there's a group of maybe four people that come to my page every single time I post something and say, this is not important. You should be talking about this. This, how, you know, this don't make sense um, or, or you're wrong on this issue. You need to be stick with, uh, one of their main things is cash reparations, cash reparations. Who says I don't support cash reparations? And then you know, what they do is they take clips of things you said and they, they try to make a narrative like, oh, Tamika Mallory doesn't support cash reparations. Actually, what I said was that I don't believe that reparations is just cash. I didn't say don't give cash. I said it's more than cash. It's also land. It's also housing. It's opportunities. It's equity. It's being able to go not just, yes, the cash is ultimate in terms of going into the bank. But first of all, you got to be able to get approved for a loan, right? When you go into the bank, right? right? That education, that reparations for us needs to be a system overhaul. And of course, yes, cash is a part of it. And no one is taking that away. But there was a little clip that, you know, where, of course, I was saying, I don't believe that reparations is just putting cash in our hands. It's also all these other things. And now that's their narrative that Tamika Mallory doesn't support cash reparations. I don't care. Not going to even argue that point because I know what I do, what I not only what I believe in, but also what I have been supporting for years as I work alongside people like Reverend Mark Thompson and Ron Daniels and others who do work every day on reparations. So let's put that um, to the side. But they come there and they are constantly saying, I post a picture about Cardi B. Oh, this, there's better things to worry about. What I, my thought of the day today is, says who? 
about what somebody should want to talk about on their personal page. I have never been to anybody's page except yours, but other than you, I've never gone to anyone's page and said, you shouldn't talk about this. They might be in the beauty business. So it's like Yandy has Yell's skincare. And I love the fact that, you know, she does all her videos about Yell. She's so much into her, uh, you know, the, the beauty industry, learning more about it, promoting her brand. But sometimes she might want to talk about, I don't know, bubble coats. That's her prerogative. And her Everything. page. Huh? Her page, her prerogative. I'm just why, why do people think they get to police your page and tell you what you should be interested in? Like who who your people are really crazy. I'm just like if it's more important things to talk about, you should talk about them. That's what I I'm, said. Talking about, I'm talking about what I want to talk about on my page. You don't get to dictate like this. Is what I think that wrong with people, right? And I say all the time, we are not. You, this is not your grandmother's civil rights, right? We, we, mm -hmm. we have. There's a movement. We have evolved into a different space. This is hip hop culture. This is, you know, our lives. This is what we've learned and how we've we've taken on civil rights and activism and organizing as us. We didn't just follow a script and look like the last freedom fighters, and we didn't we didn't do that, right? We said to ourselves, we love the culture. We love hip hop. We love doing all of these things. But we also want to fight for our people. We don't believe that people should be dying. We, we believe in equity and equality. We want to make sure that we're utilizing our platforms and our voices to make sure our people are safe. But we're going to talk about some other shit sometimes. We're going we, we to, because that's who we are. We are not one dimensional individuals. We are not who you want us to be. And if you if, if that's what you're looking for, you got to go find that. You can't come on my page and tell me what how activism, oh, you're supposed to be an activist. You shouldn't be talking about, you don't get to tell me that, bro. If I'm an activist, right? And activity means if you disrespect me, I'm going to say, yeah, you can't disrespect me. If I think you're trying to harm me, I'm, I might beat you up. I'm not going to shoot you. I ain't going to stab you. But we might get into a fist fight because that's my activism. That's how activism looks for me. It yeah, looks that way. Exactly. Malcolm was by the window with his thing saying, look, by any means necessary. Mm -hmm. Activism looks different to different people. So I don't want you to hold me to a level of activism to where you might have seen Martin Luther King. I love Martin Luther King. I love his speeches. I love a lot of things about him. But I'm practicing nonviolence. Like I'm it's, I'm still struggling for me. I'm anti-violent. means I'm against. Nonviolence means you will never engage. I'm against violence. But the minute that you try to harm me or you do something that's detrimental to me and my family, I'm going to protect myself. I'm going to speak up against things that I don't like. I don't care. I come from hip hop. So when something bothers me in hip hop, I'm going to say something about it. Oh, you shouldn't be worried about that. Ain't you? No, bro. I'm worried about who can rap over here. And I'm also worried about getting our foot off our neck. I can worry about all those things. You don't get to tell me that I don't have opinion because that's what you think activism looks like. That's what you think civil rights leadership looks like. I'm sorry. That's not who I am. Right. If and you I swing at me, I'm throwing a two piece, man. And I tell people all that. Well, you're a little. Yeah, I'm going to throw a two piece. You're a little touched. But overall, I agree with you a thousand percent that folks should find the folks that are doing what you want to do or you should do it, right? Everybody is not going to do things the same way. We all have what we are very interested in. So, so another person jumped in the comments and says, well, why are you mad at this person? Which, by the way, is a troll. And it's, well, the, the, the person said, I'm not a troll. I am, I'm just being consistent. You are a troll when I go to your page and you have either no pictures or a fake profile. You are a troll, right? You're a troll when, you come, when you've been coming to my page for several months and I disrespectfully tell you to get the hell off my page and that I don't care about anything you have to say 
whatever the issue is, whatever it is that you're trying to tell me, I'm not listening to it, period. If I'm going to get to this point, if I'm going to get to that point, it's going to be because somebody else who also may not agree with me, but has a level of respect. And I can tell where that person is coming from, that they're not there trying to make me out. First of all, once you share a little clip of me that only speaks to part of what I said and try to build a narrative around it, you're a troll and I don't fuck with you. That's it. So you, 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 you off the list. But if you come to me, just like I've had people, I think about my brother, Tony Lindsay, um, who he and I often don't agree or uh, we ultimately agree about black folks' safety and freedom, but we often don't agree with certain candidates or certain things. But when he comes to me, if he sees one of those little clips, sis, what, you know, what was this or whatever? He doesn't send me a message, Tamika, Tamika, you know, what you meant by this? Yeah, that's what, that's the problem with you. Like, who are you talking to? I'm not your kid. I'm not your kid. You don't, you don't, you don't support my organization. You don't support me. And you come here talking to me. And you could come and say, hey, can you please help me understand what this meant in this clip? Because I don't necessarily get it. And here's what we're fighting for, sis. And I'm trying to see whether or not there can be some alignment. You speak to me like that all day. I have something to say. But when you come to my page and you start sharing it and putting up things and Tamika's not for this and you ain't this. You're trying to create a narrative. I see what you're trying to do. Just keep it moving. I'm not for you. I am not for you. And that's okay because there are artists out here that sing R&B that I don't like it the way they sing it. So they're not for me. There are people out here that are elected officials that folks come to me and say, she's black, you should support her. But I look at things that she does and I don't support it and I'm not going to work with that individual. There are other organizations that I don't like how they move. They might be the ones that go out in the, in the streets and when they protest and they saying, fuck the police, fuck the police, I'm going to shoot you, you know, we, we kill police. That is not the way that I choose to protest. And therefore, you probably won't see me doing much collaboration with those groups, right? Especially because when the shit goes down, right? When it's all said and done and they, the, and they decide to come down on us, guess who oftentimes gets the shit that goes with the fuck the police speech. Me, they don't put you on Fox News every night and tell white crazy people that ultimately become my harassers and people who are sending me death threats. They don't put you on there. They don't care. They don't use your name. It's me that they plaster on freaking Fox News at night saying that I'm a terrorist or that I'm relate. I have relationships with other terrorists and that I support terrorism. It's me. So I have to be careful about what I do and don't do. We're not on the same level. We're just not. We're just not. And, that, and, and guess what? I am also not on the same level as other people who are in this work that I realize have higher stakes than me. So there's certain things that I can do that other individuals can't because if they do it, they will actually be arrested, actually be arrested. So, I, you know, when I so another person jumped in the comments and said, oh, well, you know, we should be collaborating. We should really be working together instead of us being against one another. And that person's page looked like a troll also. But I took the time to explain that everybody is not, does not want your opinion. Just because somebody is a Black leader or whatever does not mean that they feel safe in certain environments with certain individuals, right? They can feel like working with you is going to bring out the worst in me, or I already see that I don't like the way you move and I don't want to work with you. That's okay. But you, sir, who seems to be defending this other individual, you should go work with them. And wait for you to do it. It That's makes so much do. sense. Because it worked for you, obviously, the way that they work and the way that they move and the things they say, they coincide with your moral compass and where you want to see things go. So you should align with them. And I'll continue to align with the people that work best for me. It's simple. And then, and then I guess the response to that is, well, how can we ever get to where it is we're going if we can't sit down with people don't, we don't agree with? And I'm going to say it again. There are many people, I think, I mean, people in my family, people that I work with, I don't halfway agree with you 80% of the time, 
you and I get into disagreement. I don't agree with Angelo about half, you know, some of the things that he says. People don't agree with me. There are other individuals that are out here that contact me all the time. They don't support uh, something I said. They don't like the way that we're organizing. They feel like we should be doing better, this, that, different or whatever. But because they approach me with a certain level of respect, where it's not trolling, where it is not harassment, because once I tell you two, three times, I don't give a shit what you have to say, leave me alone. If you keep talking to me and keep coming back to my page, that becomes harassment, right? Because yeah, once it's rooted in disrespect, I, it's off. Once, and you could go if you're, until if you're, if your comment or anything is rooted in disrespect, it's a non-starter for me. Right. You could go to Until Freedom's page and talk all day long, but my page, you don't get to come there and keep on trying to tell me that I have to speak to issues the way that you say. I probably will never do it. So that means that I may not be the leader for you. Now, there are other people who, who, who come to me and they say, you know, I think you should change the way, you know, you speak to certain issues or whatever. And I think about it and I say, hmm, that's important. Maybe I could do this different. Maybe I could move differently in these areas or speak in a different way. That comes from the way you approach people. And no, you can't then turn around and go, oh, it, you know, oh, well, 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 let me let's start all over. Not after for months and months you've been disrespecting me, going to your own page, writing all of these things about me. That's no not man. true. Huh? No, no, no man. Man. that's not right. So that's what I have to say in my thought of the day. Leave people alone that don't want to deal with you. And all you, you, you work as hard as I have worked to become the leader that you want to see in the world. And that is so simple, man. It's Everything ain't for everybody. I am a quiet taste. I am not for everyone. And I acknowledge that. And I appreciate those people who stay in their lane and stay away from me because we don't have the same views or even have the same more. And I'm okay with that. I don't wish you no harm. I wish you the best because if you ultimately want what's best for Black people, then we ultimately want the same thing. So if you get there first, then I'm a, I'm gonna applaud you and I'm gonna follow you if you if you f figure out a strategy that's gonna get us there better than the strategy I figured out to get us there then I might follow that but until then I'm gonna follow the strategy that I know that works best for me and aligns with it is that I want to see that there it is enough said enough said that's how we own it that's how we own it. So we're being joined by a true powerhouse today. And, you know, often we have two guests that come on and, you know, we talk to one individual who's really an expert and another who's a change maker doing incredible work in our community. And today we have one individual who embodies both things. Uh, Jason Flores Williams is an author, a political activist, and a civil rights attorney. He's best known for his legal work on behalf of death row clients, political protesters, the homeless population of Denver, and his lawsuit to have Colorado, the Colorado River recognized as a legal person, which is something that we're going to learn more about today because I didn't know that a river it could be a legal person, um, but I'm sure Jason is going to explain it. Um, uh, Attorney Williams is an acknowledged expert in conspiracy law and First Amendment cases whose views are frequently sought out by media organizations like the Washington Post, the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, and of course, street politicians. And we're so happy to have you today, uh, Attorney Williams, but I think it's okay for us to call you Jason. You got that right. I prefer it. Thank you. It's a privilege to be on your show. Thank you so much for uh, coming on yeah. and speaking with us. So you you specifically focus on something that is really important to us, which is um, the the sentencing disparities for marijuana convictions. You got a number of clients that you're dealing with, high profile individuals, some uh, Rock Nation, Jay-Z and others have been involved with trying to help get these individuals free. Tell us about that work. No, but what I can tell you is, is the reason I got into this law and I was kind of born into it in a way was when I was 12 years old, my, fa my family was ripped apart by the drug war. My father got sentenced to 35 years in prison. And so I spent 
uh, you know, my youth going to visit my old man in the joint. And then uh, now, you know, I said, look, I can't let what happened to my family happen to other people. So it's personal. Mm. And when it comes down to sentencing disparities, so imagine that I represent, well, not imagine, I do represent people from across the board, racially, socioeconomically. And what I see consistently is that what you are going to be offered in court with regard to marijuana prosecutions or drug war prosecutions in general is going to be dependent upon who you are, meaning what race are you, uh, where you come. You know, at a certain point, money in the criminal justice system overcomes everything. But for the average person, say you take the average black man and you take the average white man, I can tell you in general that the average black man is going to be offered <clears throat> generally more time than the average white man. And I see it consistently over the last 20 years. You're going to, and expanding out and away from just the drug war is that, and I think, you know, you'll know this, the statistics bear this out is that they're going to seek the death penalty where they still seek the death penalty <clears throat> for people of color much more frequently than they will for uh, white people. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like they say, there, there ain't no money on death row. And in a lot of ways, there's not that much money in the joint. So, yeah, this is what I see. But this all goes back to really what is this thing we call the drug war? What is this thing we call the criminal justice system? And the criminal justice system, of course, is mostly made up of drug crimes. That's what people in uh, federal prisons and state prisons are doing. That's why they're there, drug crimes. Mm -hmm. And what this is, is like, the way I see it is they've always tried to kill two birds with one stone on this deal. Uh, the drug war started off as an assault against Chicanos and Latinos. You know, they didn't like the fact that Mexicans were coming into Texas and California. And so they penned, you know, uh, they pinned, I should say, <clears throat> cannabis or mota or pot on the Mexicans and try to make it into a dirty thing. At the same time, you have weed coming up in the jazz culture. And what happened is there, so you got kind of two birds there, so you can take out people of color by associating them with a non-white drug at the time, although it's interesting, there's evidence that the founding fathers used pot, if you want to call them the founding fathers. But that's that was one. And then two, when we got into the Nixon era, you had the rise of the counterculture. Mm -hmm. And so by being able to criminalize mm -hmm. people, people of color and the counterculture. And really, if you look at American history, anytime you get this, you, the, a, a, even a potential whiff of a union between the lower classes or even middle educated classes, people of color, the main power structure in the United States always has to do something to break that up because that's its worst fear. Right. So, so in that case, so marijuana, Nixon, the drug war, I mean, it was just, you know, it was a thing of beauty. They just went around, they destroyed families like mine. They, they, uh, they incarcerated, you know, just massive amounts of people of color indiscriminately and disproportionately. And then also at the same time, you know, you got people who think differently and the free thinkers, regardless of race or color, who end up, you know, doing 20 years for a joint. And so, hey, <clears throat> you know, power structure did what it needed to do. And in a lot of ways, it's still doing it. Mm. Because now if you look at who's making the money, I mean, you got Al Harrington. You know who he is? Mm -hmm. basketball no, player. I don't know. You do? No, he, he's a, he, was a, he was a basketball player. And now he's out there. Um, he's out there. He's a brilliant guy. He's uh, what he's what he's investing in is using the, the emerging green industry, the green rush as a way to empower people of color. He says he wants to make 100 black millionaires in uh, the, the new cannabis industry. But despite that, despite that right now as it stands, it's the same old assholes making all the money. And what really makes me wanna, I don't know, break something or just keep fighting is that a lot of times with cannabis right now, the people making the money with people who are putting people away for it just 10 years ago, which absolutely makes me sick. Mm -hmm. So, hey, you know, I got people right now in jail, in super maxes, um, looking at life in prison for pot. I got people, you know, and this is not even to get into, and I know I've been talking for a while, this is not even to get into the kind of constitutional violations that the drug war and cannabis have enabled law enforcement to enact and violate upon poor people, people of color, everyone else. So, hey, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of the American way that we're dealing with here. Hmm. 
Yeah, that is something that I've been talking about a lot. I have a lot of, you know, being formerly incarcerated and just coming from the, the hood, quote unquote, mm -hmm. and knowing a lot of different individuals who that was their source of just survival, you know, selling pot and other things. And a lot of them did a lot of time, or served a lot of time. And now, you know, that is, is being able to be profited off of, is becoming something legalized. These same individuals who did 10, five, and six, seven years, she would have the opportunity to be able to engage in that field, right? Because you, you took their freedom away from now, all of a sudden it's legal. You've criminalized these people for something that's legal now. And now they don't have any recourse, they don't have any opportunities to make money. So, you know, like you said, it's the same old people, man. Like, so what is the process? What should we be doing? You know, is there any. I heard that there was supposed to be some type of state grants and things of that nature that would give for people who were formerly incarcerated for marijuana some type of opportunities. What, like, what is what does those things look like? Well, I mean, I hope so. But I mean, when we're talking about state grants, I don't know how state grants and that kind of money is going to equalize the power uh, differentials when it comes to just already having money, right? I mean, what we know here is there's a difference between income and capital, wealth. So you make income, say you make like 70 Gs a year, you feel like you're, you know, maybe you're doing all right and you, know, you busted your ass to be able to make 70. You get up to you know, 100, you still, but you're still making that income and income really doesn't simply provide you with the kind of opportunities to garner a place in an emerging industry. It's wealth. So like, for example, right? So I made some money, my firm, we made some money off some, uh, you know, saying, hey, we'll help you try to get licenses in pot in various states. I can tell you, everyone who got a license was already rich. It's because they had, they could show the resources so that the state, first off, with resources come connections, they know who you are, they're comfortable with you. Then everybody was already as rich, they could show that they could pull it off and could do everything that they say they were doing or that they said they were going to do, even if they didn't, as far as their plans and applications for licenses, we're going to have a dispensary, we're going to have this, that, you know, cannabis spa and bail, whatever it's going to be. And so it's the ability to be, uh, it's the ability to be able to show resources, not just income, or the ability, the ability to show resources and not just, you know, basically state grants, I'm not going to call them a loan, but some degree of money that enables people access to the game. Right. So that's what right. I worry. That's what I, that's what I worry about. Right. Is like we can say, hey, we're going to do this. We're going to do that. And we're going to we're going to try to, you know, slide a few bucks in a, in a couple different ways. That's why I go back to Harrington, because I think he has a good vision for it. He's like saying, I'm not trying to get black people or people of color or people who, you know, who have suffered because of the drug war, just licenses. I'm trying to get them into that wealth zone with regard to this industry so we can carve out a place in an industry that just a few years ago, and still is to a large degree, absolutely resulted in the oppression and incarceration of poor people and people of color in the United States. So I don't know, man, I'm down. Hey, oh. I'm with you. Let's get, let's get some state grants going and all that kind of stuff, but I don't know how that's gonna fix the disparity. Right, so exactly how that fixes the disparity, because you know it's like the image that you see, um, I've seen you know folks post it, where it shows the difference between equity and equality and how equality may be the two of us making the same amount of money now. But regardless, if you started with more than me, you'll we'll never actually be equal. And equity would mean stopping to some degree, um, I guess in this situation, uh, those people who have extreme capital, which would most likely be white men, from being able to access all of the licenses and open in all of their marijuana locations, we would put that on hold while bringing up the amount of people who are either, you know, come from marginalized communities, people who um, uh, are, you know, formerly incarcerated, as has been said, and just people who don't otherwise have the opportunities. But I can't imagine a, a place, a time in American history where we would ever see um, you know, white men not benefiting from the capital that they have. So I, I, I do agree with you about that. So I, I know that you can't stay with us forever, although you're so packed with 
information that we could sit here and talk to you for a while, but you have a number of cases um, that you're dealing with now that are actually very high profile cases um, that you're involved with. Do you want to talk about some of them? And, um, and, and, and also, is there a way that we as an activist community can help to bring attention to what is happening in this moment with some of the individuals that you work with? I mean, that's a great question. And I appreciate it. And yeah, I've got, like, like I said earlier, I've got guys who are right now sitting who for weed sitting in supermax jails uh, awaiting trials right now. But what, when you say stuff. weed, um, Jason, what does that mean? Does it mean they had truckloads of uh, marijuana where they were making millions of dollars or were they was it small level cases like when you say what's the scale of weed that we're talking about well usually these days i'm going to be straight with you although i just saw a case out of iowa where a, where a guy was going to prison for just possession more normally these days what we're talking about is distribution all that means really is well you got white capital right mm -hmm. You've got the, the usual suspects in the suits with the MBAs uh, who are making millions of the off the exact same activity, mm. except so there, you know, investments, hedge funds, cannabis is a market. That's all it is. I remember in federal court recently, I was arguing about cannabis and I, and I made something called an equal protection argument, which is the 14th Amendment. And that says, hey, you got to treat citizens the same. The equal protection, uh, the equal protection actually came out of um, uh uh, immediately after the Civil War, when it was obvious, they're like, hey, we had a Civil War. Yeah, black people are free. We're great and everything. Well, obviously, it was all bullshit because we had Jim Crow come in. So they had to do something called the 14th Amendment to try to protect the rights of all people. So the 14th Amendment says, hey, citizens are treated uniformly, allegedly. So I was in court making a 14th Amendment argument saying, hey, you got this guy being busted for weed, facing 20 years in prison. This is in federal court. And meanwhile, you have other people who uh, are right now, uh, you know, driving in BMWs to their dispensaries and selling licensing, and there's intellectual property rights and investment opportunities and all this kind of stuff in the pot biz. Anyway, I said, hey, you know, let's just imagine that weed was widgets. And these are just widgets ec economically. And the prosecutor freaked out, widgets, widgets, what the hell? These are all, you know, I just started making this thing that I was just looking at marijuana as just another commodity upon which millions and billions of dollars are being made, which they are. So turning this back into what we're looking at and the kind of the kind of things that I'm seeing these days, all I'm seeing is the same old disparities, mm. right? The same old thing, the people that I have in jail who are high profile or not high profile, and they end of the day, you know, jail cells don't have names on them. You know, it don't matter if you're high profile or not high profile, you're going to be in a jail cell, you're in a jail cell. And you know that, my friend, because you just talk about being incarcerated. That's right. So that's right. So so at the end of the day, you're in a supermax, you're in a supermax, you're in a freaking county jail, you're in a county jail. But isn't it interesting that after the 14th Amendment and that and the movement after the Civil War is called Reconstruction is after the 14th Amendment and after everything else and after the legalization after proving that the drug war is essentially been bs from day one which we and racially motivated incentivized what we see is the same old thing happening mm. the same old thing even better i mean it's even a better deal because they're still using the drug war to incarcerate people of color free thinkers killing all those birds with all them or maybe just one stone well, at the same time, the same people are making all that money. And that's what really pisses me off. So as far as bringing attention to it, what I really want to bring attention to is the way that federal prohibition of cannabis inside the greater context of the drug war itself is still being used to enforce the same power differentials in the United States. And if we can do something about that, hey, uh, you know, that's so what, what my life. What do, you think, what do you think we should start? How do we start that? Like understanding the disparities, understanding how the system is structured, and you know they've utilized us and, and criminalized us for these same things, and now making billions of dollars. What would you say as a lawyer would be a first step of us doing something to make sure that citizens that 
return the citizens who who were you know victims of being incarcerated for this and just average people in the communities have opportunities to be able to benefit from it. okay well two, there, there's there's really let me let me start by saying one thing you know who you know who Huey Newton was, right? Yes, sir. Of course, of course. So you have Huey Newton, right? Huey, uh, Huey Newton, uh, you know, uh, allegedly killed, or you know, he did kill, uh, uh, shot a couple cops in Oakland. Now you would say a black man, especially Huey Newton, back in Oakland, what was it, sixty nine, seventy? And somebody's going to know that I'm off on that date, probably, or maybe I'm not. Is uh, you know, you're going down. You can't kill a cop. You can't kill white cops in Oakland, but. The Black Panthers and all the supporting communities and everything else, they went to the courthouse where he was being tried every day. And so, and ultimately, due to the fact that he had a great uh, lawyer named Charles Gary, um, he, was, uh, he was ultimately solely convicted of manslaughter and he walked out of court. It's, it's a greatly reduced charge in contrast to first degree murder. And why is that? Did something change in court? They said, no, there, there's a saying that I have that derives out of that story and that is this. What happens outside the courthouse is more important than what happens inside the courthouse. It's it, the system is set up in a way so that everybody has plausible deniability. And, you know, you, you always make a mistake, you know, referring to the Nazis. But what the hell is that? <laughs> is that, in, you know, I mean, but if you want to look at it, look at look at look at the incarceration and the deprivation of liberty and the damage that's been done to communities. You're not that far off. All right. You're not that far off in making this thing. Uh, in, the, in this comparison, but uh, the bottom line is they made it in a way, they made it mechanical so that there was always plausible deniability, moral, ethical, and legal saying, hey, I'm just a small part of this thing. Although I wish I could do something else. There's, you know, my hands are tied. So you get into the justice system, so-called, and my hands are always tied. There's nothing I can do. And, and, so, and so you just go through this and it's like, you're just going through the procedures of it. So going back to the Huey P. Newton reference, the most important saying I know and that I try to that I do employ as a litigation strategy is what happens outside the courthouse is more important than what happens inside the courthouse, it, especially in criminal cases, civil rights cases, too, because when you shine a light on the courthouse, when you pressurize that courthouse and everybody in there knows that there is a light being shown on them so they don't have that plausible deniability anymore. What happens in that courthouse is something that they will be personally and moral, morally responsible for. And I'm talking about prosecutors. I'm talking about federal judges. I'm talking about state judges. The whole deal, things change. All of a sudden, people become human beings again. They start looking at the bigger picture again. They start thinking about things other than just trying to get through the day without seeming to be damaging anyone and, and trying to get through the day under the facade and the illusion that they're good people just by being there. You got to strip them of that facade and show that if you do this, if you do X, that results in Y and Y is unethical and you're just part of a machine that's been destroying people since day one. You have got to make them know that at all costs. And if you can do that and you can, if you bust your ass and you get ferocious enough about it and pack those courthouses, things change. So that's one, that's one. And then two, and, you know, and this is kind of like a systemic solution. And so I really don't believe in systemic solutions that much. You got to think outside the box. And, you know, you got to say, we just got to bring what we can bring to this thing. Is the systemic solution is that, okay, look, for example, you got white people vote for Biden, Harris, white people vote for, uh, you know, a lot of these, a lot of these, uh, you know, Democrats is that, well, because one of the things they did, and especially it, I noticed this, they said they were going to decriminalize cannabis. And then, or, or legalize it. They said that they were going to do all sorts of things that were going to end the systemic injustice that's, you know, this part of the drug war context. Well, they don't. Now that we're here, we're a good year in, and it doesn't even look like anything's ever going to happen with regards to the legal or the end of federal prohibition. So they're supposed to be, to the degree that we have any voice in this system, the, as close as we can get to it. So I guess you can pressurize them but then at the end of the day, that's just me saying, hey, write your senator a letter, you know, and I don't really believe in writing senators letters. I believe that you got to shine a ferocious light on the system. What happens outside the courthouse is more important than what happens inside. And you got to hold people responsible. And there are ways to do that, that actually put some human life into an otherwise cold and dead system. Mm -hmm. I think it's a combination of all the things that you said. While we don't 
um, while we are all very much so um, unencouraged, I don't even know if that's the right word, by what is, what is happening with this administration and with administrations of the past, those people who are sitting at home who say, all I know I can do is write a letter. You know, I'm working two jobs a day. I'm unable to show up at the courthouse, but I'm going to write a letter and maybe donate $5 for the sandwiches for people who are outside the courthouse. Then you have people who say, you know, well, I, you know, I'm, I'm going to make sure that in every election I work for candidates that I try to get people voted in or out. Because oftentimes people think of voting as only one side, bringing people into the system, which ultimately will happen, but it can also mean firing folks who are not doing a good job. Mm -hmm. So you have those people who believe that going to the polls is one of the ways that we will um, uh, somehow accomplish freedom. And then the last piece is there are people like us that believe in putting boots on the ground. And mm -hmm. there are going to be folks who disagree or, you know, well, protesting doesn't mean anything. Voting doesn't mean anything. We have so many what doesn't mean anything when we don't necessarily understand that all things work together for the greater good. And so I hope that one of the things we take from this conversation is that in this area, even if you don't smoke marijuana or don't smoke weed, even if you don't have a family member or a loved one who is locked up right now because of marijuana, I think we all need to understand the equity conversation and how being able to access the cannabis industry could mean generational wealth for our communities. And so it's something that we should all be concerned about. I mean, that's my, my take on it. I don't know if anybody else wants to respond to that. Yeah, pretty much the same, man. I just want to, I just want to thank you for your your outlook and work that you're doing. We need people who understand the law and understand both sides to be able to articulate it the way that you actually articulate. It. I try to say it all the time, but I don't have the vernacular, you know, and I don't know all the words in the legal terms to put it this way. I just call it bullshit. You know what I'm saying? I'm just saying <laughs> basically. I just be like it's a bunch of bullshit that we're dealing with, but the way that you broke yeah. it down so eloquently is is definitely needed and um, i look forward to doing like political work our, our, our um organization until freedom we want to work on these things we want to give these opportunities for the people who've been wronged in these areas and figure out how do we connect our work to the legal work that you do so i just want to say thank you for that before oh, you, you go before yeah. you go um attorney williams tell us what it, does it mean to fight to do a lawsuit to make the Colorado River a person, we need to know that. All right. So look, I, another saying. So you got you got one saying. Maybe take two sayings out of this deal. Is one what happens outside the courthouse more important than what happens inside the courthouse? And then secondly, it's all the same fight. Okay, mm -hmm. it's something I see. And what that fight is, it's it's a fight against power differentials, right? Mm -hmm. So it's one generational wealth versus a little bit of income. Um, the, the usual suspects versus people who have been marginalized and having to deal with bullshit since day one. Um, now, when we get to something, uh, so any time that you have massive power differentials where one side has all the power and the other side doesn't have power, doesn't have rights, really at the end of the day, doesn't have rights, then you are going to have negative outcomes. Hmm. All the power, not much power equals bad outcomes, a.k.a. injustice. And so if you look at the if you look at the environmental situation, right, corporations have all the power in the world, <laughs> you know, literally and figuratively and literally more than figuratively. Right. They, and so they have all the power. And then you look at what is it that corporations do now? Corporations exploit. Now, they have some good benefits and I'm not anti-corporate, but a lot of them exploit. They, uh, they take advantage of human beings, but what they really do exploit at the end of the day is this world, this planet, which is supposed, which is supposed to be all of ours, living in a way in which we respect Earth and hopefully in some kind of sustainable way that, that integrates ourselves with it. And when we do that, I tend to think that we end up being a more just society and better people. So you have a situation like this, right? So you have, let's say you have a corporation in Arizona that wants to, it has all, it has $10 billion and it wants to open up a golf course in the desert. We know, we know, you can just look at me, you can just, we can just look at each other and say, that's bullshit. 
that doesn't need to happen. Colorado River's dying. There's not right. enough of all of right. all the of all the things and all the places where money should be going right now. The last damn thing we need is another golf course in the desert. But if they have the money, then they can buy the property rights, obtain the legal interest necessary, do whatever the hell they want to do. And that's because something as vital as the Colorado River or something or as vital as nature itself, in contrast to corporations, has no rights whatsoever. Hmm. And so that person heard term, look, the legal system is basically the, the United States legal system is essentially based on 12th, 13th century property rights, something called the Magna Carta. And so we're just based in property rights conceptions. And that's really, and that, that's, that's another conversation. But if you can get the property, then you can do what you want to do. Hmm. And so it's a way of saying, and so to, to return to that, is that our conception of things, our, our legal conception of the earth on which we depend for our existence is simply one as, that is property. That if you can buy it, you can do whatever you want to to it. So mm -hmm. that so we're stuck with words like personhood because if you're a person, allegedly you have some rights. Okay, so if you're a person, you have some rights. So in saying that the Colorado River uh, should be deemed a legal person is really just a way of saying. The Colorado, you should not be able to do to the Colorado River or the oceans or lakes or the earth, this planet, whatever the hell you want to do, because you have all the wealth and you can. And so you are there being able to exploit it and use it in any way you want, even though for the, for the greater picture, it's causing and continuing on further injustice and exploitation. Hmm. So it would say it would say that if you are doing something as inane and useless and contrary to the interest of justice in this society as opening up a golf course in the desert, then we should be able to stand up for the Colorado River and say, the Colorado River has some rights too. It's already greatly diminished so that you cannot simply drain and kill this natural entity upon which we all depend any further because this too has a degree of rights, which we simply call personhood because our law right now doesn't have the actual language for how to treat nature and really people with respect. Mm, wow. That's true. I'm going to refer to the Colorado River as my homeboy for now. No, I love that. I love that. The Colorado <laughs> River is my homeboy. My homeboy got rights too, man. Wow. Uh, you are like super duper, duper, duper intellectual and intelligent. Yeah. It's great. Yeah. I, it makes me feel like I need to go get 25 books right now and like read everything because what everything. you know and the breadth of, of the, the, the wealth of knowledge that you have is so important for our community. And I can only imagine that your clients are grateful to have you as an attorney because you're going to go to court and speak up and fight the system for them where we see so many attorneys that don't do that, uh, either because they're intimidated and or they just don't care. And therefore, they don't go do the real work and put themselves on the line. And I can imagine there are a lot of people in the courts that don't like to see uh, attorney Jason Williams coming. <laughs> you got that right. Yeah, because yeah. you're going to speak up. But I want to thank you again, as my son has said, we appreciate you and put us to work. Let us know about things that's happening where you feel like we can be of assistance, whether it be online and or in person. We do believe in putting boots on the ground. We believe that what happens outside the court makes what's inside the court shake. And so we want to continue to do that work in collaboration with you and on behalf of your clients and others that you work with. So thank you. Thank you. It's been a privilege, guys. All right. I appreciate your time. Thank you. That's how we own it. That's how we own it. Yeah, big shout out to Jason Williams, man. He is a wealth of knowledge, man. Just listening to him and just understanding his perspective. It's just broke, like I said, it broke down a lot of stuff that I'd be thinking and I'd just be saying it's bullshit, but he broke it down into legal terms and different things. Just one of the main things that he said was what the most important things is what happened outside the court, right. not inside right. the court. And, and that's been, been what we've been doing. You know, that's the work that we do it until freedom is the stuff that's outside the court. And people would say, oh, you're out there marching, you're protesting. What does that do? It gives people like Jason 
the energy, right? When he walks into a courtroom and we've and we've been advocating for something and we've got the world riled up on a specific particular subject or against a different case. Like when you look at Amar Arbery's case, the, the noise that the world makes, right? The, the anger and the frustration that the world makes has an impact. It has an impact on everything. When people start realizing that the, the status quo is not okay with you just killing black people or doing injustice against other people that are marginalized and poor people when you start to they start to hear those voices and he's like he said this is wrong and you're doing some shit that's morally wrong you know people start feeling that pressure to do the right thing so you oh, know absolutely I that made sense absolutely i agree with you a thousand percent about that and you know i think about and I think we always talk about how much people don't know uh, about what goes into the strategy around these things, right? So you have people who will say that march into your point doesn't mean anything. It's not doing anything. Well, if that's the case, if you believe that our marching and rallying means nothing, then tell me why um, the Mc McMichaels, which are the two, the father and son, um, responsible for Ahmad Arbery's killing. So they were two out of the three. One of their attorneys, he kept trying to get the case thrown out because of the rallies that were happening outside the court. The fact that Reverend Sharpton had been inside the court, Reverend Jackson and other leaders, right? And uh, the Black Panthers were outside the court. Was it the Black Panthers? Let me just make yes. sure. It was, you sure? It was the, the new, new Black, Black Panther, Panther Party. Okay. The Black Panther Party, yeah. And the new Black Panther Party was outside the court one day. They even had a casket out there um, that had the names of people who had been killed by police officers and white supremacists over many, many years. That was really upsetting to the defense because they knew that it meant something about what was happening in the court. To Jason's point, it calls on, or at least tugs on the moral conscience of the prosecutor, right? Now the prosecutor knows you've got to walk back out here in front of these people or past this community and, and answer for what you did or did not do, especially election season. Oh, people are upset. Whenever there's no noise, Whenever people are quiet about the issues, you're going to have folks try to get away with more injustice. And so I would just offer that, you know, listening to what he said, it, it really made me feel like we're doing the right thing, not because it is going to get us a guilty verdict every time, not because it is going to be the end all be all and it's going to bring us the ultimate justice and freedom. And you're damn right. There are other people who are going to do things differently. As I was saying from, you know, earlier in the show, there are people who will choose the way that they want to do their part. Everybody is not going to do it the same way. And I think, you know, for, for those of us who spend so much time criticizing, generally you find out that they do nothing, that they are either talking heads that don't hit the ground, that they have not built anything, and or that they, they literally, literally are paid provocateurs who are sent to try to disrupt what other people are doing that may not be uh, the final answer, but it certainly is a part of your legacy in terms of you fighting and you being out there in the struggle. Yeah, everybody has something to do. I mean, something to say about what somebody else is doing when they ain't doing nothing. So, you know, it's a lot going on. We have so many, so many different entry points in this movement. You know, every day I'm enlightened and I find out different things that other people are doing and try to collaborate. So a couple of weeks ago, we went to Art Basel and we met with different, you know, um, professionals who have different entry points into the movement and, and work that they're doing that's either silent or loud that we didn't even know about. And right. we were able to connect. And, 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 and it's like, stop criticizing what somebody else is doing or not doing. And just find a way to do what you think is missing. Because there's so many different 
needs inside this movement. Black people have so many different needs that we sure that you can find a way to help instead of trying to tear down what somebody else is doing. So, you yeah. know, once again, shout out to Jason, man, for that. All, yeah. all of the it's, knowledge he gave us. And there, and there are some people who will, because even I struggle with some of what he said, right? Like, not struggling because I don't think it's right, but struggling to understand it, right? He mm-hmm. is highly intellectual. And so you can you can lose some of the things that he's saying just because because of the fact that we don't practice law and we may not understand it. But I, when you really dig deeply into the sentencing disparities that he spoke to, how his clients for weed, most of them weren't moving trucks and trucks of it. He's like he said, and I get his point when he said, you know, if you did that, then good for you. It doesn't mean that he believes that it's right. What he's saying is that there are other people who are moving ships of marijuana and or cocaine or other drugs and their families are literally running American society, okay? And not just American, a bunch of other countries are ruled in many ways by the blood of drug money and guns and whatever other, you know, uh, uh, illegal activities happen in our society. And by the way, it's only illegal for certain people because if you have uh, Oxycontin, if you sell prescription drugs, you can move mountains and, and be living and going to the White House for events. <laughs> you can be, you know, running other businesses, owning uh, major corporations and whatnot. But us, you know, Johnny, who is selling some weed on the corner, he's penalized and actually pays for the crimes of big drug mob like bosses. And so, you know, I get I understand what he was saying. And I just think. We have to have more conversations that while we may not understand all the details, we have to listen to the, the, the lawyers, the legal side, the activists, the parents, the victims, like it's going to take all of us. It sure is, man. You just said, you said something that I say all the time, man. You, we, we'll kill somebody and call them the worst drug dealer in the world because they're selling the same controlled substances that these pharmaceuticals and these pharmacies are selling for years and, and, yeah. and, and, and being called the best businessmen in the world and they're billionaires, you know, and like you said, Johnny is going to do 20 and 30 years for selling the same exact thing somewhere. So that's, that brings me to, well, I don't get it. There's this, this stigma about criminality, mm. right? And um, being formerly incarcerated, you know, I deal with this all the time, that people want to hold you to being, quote unquote, a criminal. Well, now, first of all, I was falsely incarcerated and accused of crimes I didn't commit, and I served time for those crimes, you know. But second of all, it was over 20 years ago, mm. right? You understand what I'm saying? It was a crime. I was 19 years old. Over 20 years ago, I, I served seven years for a crime that I didn't commit. And people will constantly, I see this in my DMs all the time. Oh, you're fake. You was a criminal and this and that. And it's like, at what point do a crime that you commit, at what point does it say, you say, okay, this individual served the time, whether they did it or not. The last 20 years of this man's life has been about productivity. The 20 years prior to that was about productivity. Like, at what point do do you start to realize that the the worst mistake a person might have made in their lives because there are people who are formerly incarcerated who have done their crimes yes, and they've come home and, and made amends and they've done everything possible to make amends and become productive members of society and i just don't get why there is a, a mind state amongst people that because a person commits one crime serves their time moves on that they're just these bad evil people who can never be you know reconstructed who have, who can never be rehabilitated who can never do anything positive without without escaping that one crime that they commit and it's, it's just it's really a messed up situation i'm on an organization i'm on a board of an organization called time done shout out to my boy jay jordan and what's we're fighting to get the rights back for formerly incarcerated people right like 
because we deal with so many stigmas, like it's still jobs I can't get. I still can't get THA pre-check. I still, you know, it's, it, these things won't, they won't allow me to have any of these things. I travel, I'm a diamond member, all of these things. And I can't get TSA pre-check because I got a felony on my record. And, and there are so many other things. There's certain jobs and places that I'm, I won't be able to go to. I can't go to Canada because I got a felony on my record. No matter how many shows or whatever it is, I will never be able to go to these certain places because I got a felony. And, and it's like, we're working on getting these records expunged after you you serve a certain amount of time free and you show to be a productive member, you haven't gotten into any crimes, you haven't done anything, that your record be completely expunged and there's no even mention of the crime that you did. And I think that's something that really needs to happen because there's so many beautiful, educated, professional people that are just held by these consequences of crimes they committed 20 and 15 and some even 30 years ago. And it's just, mm. it's just not right. Well, we should definitely have uh, Jay Jordan to come on and talk about yeah, the time gun campaign. Uh, Cause you know, when I found out that, I, I think you were telling me you can't walk dogs, you can't be a dog walker. Uh, if you have a felony, you can't get a barber's license to open a shop in most states. And of course, the problem with our society is that every state gets to operate in a different way. And then I'm contradicting myself because I'm saying that's a problem in our society. But then there are states that if the rule of law was based upon some of our governors, some of the governors in this country, we would be in up shit's creek. Because when you think about a place like Texas, where they're taking away a woman's right to choose with her body, if that was the norm across the country, then that would also be a problem. So we just have such shit because you could be in one state that will allow you as a person who is formerly incarcerated with a felony on your record, you can be in that state and get your barber's license, but then you go over here to this state and you can't. It's, it's like people are pushed, their backs are slammed up against the wall. And we have to figure out, as you said, how to sort of right side it. So I think we've got to have Jay jo Jordan on. Um, and you know, Mice, I think, yes, it is true that this system has done so much to try to suck the energy out of people like you and Jay and others. But I'm just so, this is my praise and worship moment, how God is so good. Because to see where you and Jay started, right? to know where you were when I first met you and to see how hard you work every day, regardless of all those things that are trying to stop you. You can't, you couldn't do several shows in Canada. You couldn't go to something big um, in Australia, I think it was. Um, you, like you said, every time we get to the airport, some of us are, and it's not just you. It's not just you. You and Linda Sarsour, who ain't never been in trouble for anything in her life, can't get pre-checked because she is a Muslim woman uh, whose family is from Palestine, even though she's an American citizen, and she is on a list of restrictions in America where she cannot get the same rights that I have. And, and, and yet y'all still push past all of that and you keep going. And so I just wanna say that it is incredible to watch, and I, I'm assuming you will say you are the exception and not the rule, right? But it is incredible to watch how, despite all that this system is doing to try to hold you back, to try to stop you from achieving your greatness, you continue to plow through and push your way forward and look at all that you have accomplished just in the last almost decade that I have known you and you've been working at uh, you know, th through so many challenges, even since you were a young child. So, well, how it's the people. Thank you. Thank you for that acknowledgement. You know, it means a lot. But like you said, I'm an exception, not the rule. And I, and I, and I, and I don't want, I don't want the success of other people that's in my same situations or lack thereof with what's considered success of them to be judged by me because you know I have. I, I, com I call it is a combination of luck, is a combination of drive, it's a combination of access, it's all of those things play a, a part 
in what it is my success is. A lot of people that come from the same situations don't have that same access, right? They come home with the drive and they have the, the skill and they don't have the, the access and they don't have the luck. And two of the things out of whack, you know. I don't believe in luck. I believe there's in some level blessings. of luck because because I don't well, believe in or, luck. It's blessings. Blessings. So you they haven't they haven't run into their blessings as of yet. Okay. You know what I'm saying? So there's there's so many different situations. The average individual doesn't know that most people that are in successful situations was one second away from being incarcerated, especially when you when you come from our communities. The most successful people will tell you there was a time that they was in the car with something they shouldn't have been in. There was they was with a friend doing something they should have done, or they participated in something, and by the grace of God, you know, they didn't get caught. And they were able to make a decision and change their lives. And they go on to be successful and, you know, productive members of society without felonies. You know, that's a lot of people's stories. So just understand, I just want people to know that you or somebody you love or somebody you respect was probably seconds away from being on the opposite side of that fence. You know, so when you pass judgment and you think that these people are no good or and you want to call them criminals and think they just they deserve not to have anything or not the right to be able to evolve and, and grow. Just understand that, you know, you, you're coming from a, a point of privilege a lot of times and a point of perspective that you're not you're not giving the other opposite spectrum the opportunity to even understand where they come from. Well, God bless. And with that said. We've come to the end of another dope show. Shout out to Jason Williams for his knowledge. Attorney Att Jason Attorney Williams. Attorney Jason Williams for his knowledge, you know, that broke so many things down that Quickly. we didn't even know. Listen, Colorado River is my homeboy now. It's a person. <laughs> it ain't just a river. You know what I'm saying? So it's shout out to him. Person. A person, you know what I'm saying? So we want to shout him out. Shout out to all our fans. Thank y'all for continuing to tune in, you know, listening to us debate, you know, argue, go back and forth, you know, give have different point of views. And we appreciate y'all. If you have any ideas for topics or people you want us to interview, please make sure you hit us up on Instagram, Street Politician Pod, DM us, let us know your information. If you have any products, small business, if you are a small business and Business being the key word, because you can be small, but you have to be a business. You got to be a business for us to promote you. Let us know and let us know your products so we can promote you on there. Once again, we're the number one podcast. Number, yeah. one, <laughs> number one in the world. And we're growing, we're moving fast. We got Shout a lot of work. Mika for coming up here, dropping her jewels. You know, she always got the good background, makeup on fleek, hair done. You know what I'm saying? Look. Y'all can say what you want, but we be fresh, man. Our skin be clear and all that. Don't act like that we ain't out here, man. Until freedom. Let me shame this plug. Integrity over income is always integrity over income, man. But once again, we love y'all. We're not going to always be right. Tamika's not going to always be wrong, but we will both always, and I mean always, be That's authentic. How we own it. Peace. Salute. That's how we Listen to Street Politicians on the Black Effect Network on iHeartRadio. And catch us every single Wednesday for the video version of Street Politicians on iWomen.tv.